In this video, we are going to discuss about empirical evaluation of generic convolution and recurrent network for sequence modeling. The research paper proposed an algorithm known as temporal convolution network, or in short PCN, for sequence to sequence modeling. The algorithm is an extension of popular framework known as CNN for time series data. This figure describes how a generic convolution network operates. So basically, you have an input which in turn is passed to a series of convolution and pooling layers. The convolution layer has an activation function ReLU. Once all the convolution is done, the output is passed to a series of dense layer. The last layer is a softmax layer in which each element contains probability of that event to occur. For example, in this example, our aim is to predict what vehicle type is. So each element has been associated for each vehicle type. For example, car, truck, van. And at each output, we are going to have a probability. For example, 0.1 to car, 0.2 to truck. And all the probability will sum up to 1. And this screen contains a much detailed version of our earlier representation. Here, you can see that we have mapped the matrix shape with each block. So our input is a 28 by 28 by 1 image which is passed to a kernel 1 block which contains 5 by 5 kernel filters. Once all the filters are applied to the input image, the output size is 24 by 24 by the n1 where n1 is the number of filters that we have. This output is passed to max polling layer of 2 by 2 size which will have the first and second dimension. After that, a second convolution layer is applied with 5 by 5 kernel. The output is then again passed to a max polling layer, which is in turn is passed to a dense layer. And at final, we have our final softmax layer represented in red. Uh, so in this example, we need to predict which digit the image contain. So as a result, we have a final vector with 10 possible outcomes. The outcome with maximum probability is the one which will get assigned. This architecture is good for classification and regression tasks in which we have a fixed outcome. However, in case of tasks like forecasting where we need a series of output, CNN might not be a good choice. The most popular algorithm which are being used for dealing with these tasks are the one which support sequence to sequence architecture for example RNN, LSTM, GRU etc. However these algorithms have their own shortcoming. In theory the algorithm like LSTM, GRU are good at retaining long term information but in practicality that is not the case. The paper proposed the extension of CNN architecture for sequence to sequence problem. The underlying principle is the input and output sequence the model will be of same length. By that we mean that suppose our algorithm is a black box. We feed a vector x and the output vector is y. Both x and y will have same dimension. Since we are dealing with a forecasting problem so, there can be no leakage from future to past. By that we mean is the algorithm cannot look at future value when forecasting. Now, in order to deal with the first principle, we use a 1D convolution network. A 1D convolution network takes and put a three dimensional tensor and output a three dimensional tensor. The input tensor of our TCN implementation has a shape, batch size, input length, input size, and the output tensor has a shape, batch size, input length, and output size. Since every layer in a TCN has the same input and output length, only the third dimension of our input and output tensor differ. Now, for a univariate case, both input and output size will be same, but for a multivariate case, the input and output size may differ depending if we want to forecast every component of the input sequence. So now let's start with example. 
Let's take a case where both input and output channels are 1 and our kernel size is 3. So when we slide our kernel to the input tensor, there is a dot computation happening with input elements and the kernel and the output will be stored in our output tensor. The next figure show two such operations. As you can see, the output tensor collect the output of kernel and input tensor dot multiplication. So this is how we obtain our output tensor. Now when we perform this operation, the input tensor and output tensor might not be of same length. To ensure our first principle of input and output length to be same, we add some zero padding to our output tensor. Zero padding is always equal to kernel size minus one to keep subsequent layer the same length as previous layer. The second principle can be achieved through causal convolution. Here, output at time t is only converted with elements from time t and earlier of previous layer. That is, elements in the output sequence can only depend on elements that came before in the input sequence. So in the example, you can see that we have input in three hidden layers as well as an output layer. Now each element i in a layer can interact with element i in previous layer and element i minus 1 of previous layer. Cannot interact with i plus 1, i plus 2 or any other element of previous layer. This ensures there is no target leak from future into past. So TCN is just the combination of 1D convolution network, zero padding, and causal convolution. This may produce sequence to sequence output, but this has some serious drawback. A major disadvantage of this basic design is that in order to achieve a long effective history size, we need an extremely deep network or very large filters. The solution to this is a dialectic convolution, which enables an exponentially large receptive field, where d is the dilation factor and k is the filter size. The effective history of a layer is k minus 1 times d. Let's look at an example. Here the first layer is just like the previous example. Here the element in i can refer to element i and i minus 1 of previous layer. However, the element of second layer which has a dilation of 2 can refer to the element i and i minus 2 of previous layer. Similarly, the third layer can refer to i and i minus 4 of previous layer. As you can see, with each layer, the receptive field is increasing exponentially. In common, when we use dilation convolution, we increase d exponentially with the depth of a network that is d equal to o to the power of 2i at level i of the network. This ensures that there is some filter that hits each input within the effective history while also allowing for an extremely large effective history using deep network. Now here's an example what would have happened if we have not used it, a causal convolution. As you can see, in this example, the element at i can interact with i, i minus 1 and i plus 1 of previous layer. Now, we can see that there is a target leakage. The element of this layer can interact with future values as well. So that's why a normal convolution network cannot be used for forecasting and we need a variation like temporal convolution network for that. Since we are dealing with very large network, so we use a residual connection which is common to this kind of network. A residual block containing a branch leading out to a series of transformation whose outputs are added back to the input block. This effectively allow layers to learn modification to the identity mapping rather than the entire transformation which has repeatedly been shown to benefit very deep networks. 
receptive field allow a TCN network to be stabilized. So here is how a typical residual block of a TCN look like. We have two layers of dialectic convolution with a ReLU as an activation layer. For normalization, we have used a weight normalization and for regularization, we have used a dropout. However, whereas in standard ResNet architecture, the input is added directly to the output of the residual function, in TCN, the input and output could have different widths. To account for discriminant input output width, we use an additional one by one convolution to ensure that element wide addition receive tensor of same shape. So now let's look some example in which everything is put together. Here we can see two residual blocks on top of each other. The first residual block contain four layer with a dilation factor of one, two, four and eight. The second residual block start with where the first residual block end. It also contain four layers. In the next example, we have three residual block. As you can see from here, the receptive field is increasing rapidly while the residual block ensure that the network is stabilized. So how should we use a TCN for forecasting? Now, as we mentioned that a TCN model ensure that we have an output which have same dimension as input. Now this output needs to be passed to a series of dense layer to make sure that our output dimension is that we desired. So our final architecture for forecasting will look like this. We have TCN block, we have dense layer, we put together in a network and we train them like we normally do where x is the input time series y is the expected time series and any difference will be passed through back propagation and through our optimizer will get a fine-tuned model now in practice a tcn model most of the time will outperform an lstm or an rnn architecture based model that's all for this video